Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope everybody was able to find some, uh, a seat. Um, we have a huge crowd outside waiting, so you're lucky. Uh, so uh, how many of you have not heard of Deaf Core or Interop Working Group here? Have not heard? <laughs> All right, excellent. We have a couple of people, so uh, we're here to answer any questions you might have, uh, provide a little bit of history. Uh, I am Agle Sigler, and uh, Mark Walker uh, is uh, my co-chair on the Interop Working Group, and we've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, so a bit of history. A uh, long, long time ago, there were many different OpenStack deployments, and uh, my OpenStack looked very different from Mark's OpenStack, and the board decided that that was not cool. And uh, the board back then, I think it was in Hong Kong, uh, released a resolution to create DEFCOR committee. Uh, DEFCOR uh, was chosen as a word to, I think it says, defining core. And um, the idea was that uh, this committee will wrangle all the different open stacks and create a guideline uh, that says, if you want to call yourself open stack, you must have these things. Um, so, What's with the name DEFCORE and why are we no longer using it? Uh, some people were coming up to us and says, I don't understand what this DEFCORE is. So we decided that it doesn't really reflect what we're doing. We're about community and we're about in interoperability. Uh, so we changed our name to Interop Working Group. Interop because it's easier to say for me than interoperability, which I can say some of the time. Um, so why do we care who can call themselves OpenStack? As I mentioned, um, different deployments of OpenStack can look different, and uh, it's really not great for interoperability. Uh, if I am a developer deploying uh, applications on OpenStack clouds, and uh, Mark's uh, OpenStack has Neutron, and my OpenStack has Nova Networks, and uh, uh, the app I'm writing uh, is expecting Neutron, but it's not gonna work with Nova Networks, so that, that's not a great user experience. Um, so uh, the OpenStack Foundation will not issue you, now, uh, will not, would, really does not want you calling yourself OpenStack if you're running things that are not part of the guideline. Um, uh, so as part of the DEF core or interop, uh, we, we now have guidelines and uh, I think we'll be talking about later. Mark will uh, go over like how they're created and uh, what they look like. And, uh, but right now, if I want to call my deployment OpenStack, I have to pass a certain guidelines. And uh, those guidelines have a set of lists, uh, a, a set of tests that I must pass in order to call myself OpenStack. Uh, the tests are right now calling APIs. So you may say, okay, I have this OpenStack deployment, so uh, I, pa or my test pass these APIs, therefore I can call myself OpenStack. Is that all that's really needed? No, you also must have a uh, designated code base uh, as part of your deployment. So for example, if you're, if you're exposing Nova APIs, you also must be running Nova tests, uh, Nova code. Uh, this, you might think like, okay, well, that's usually the case. Well, not really. We'll cover that a little bit later. But, so yes, it's not just about APIs, it's not just about tests, you must be running OpenStack code. So if you're a user, why do you care about branding? Um, well, you probably don't unless you're uh, looking for OpenStack logo to buy, or you're looking to buy some OpenStack cloud and you think, okay, Mark's, Mark has OpenStack and Agli has OpenStack, uh, I'll buy it and I'm sure they will be the same. But how do you know that they're uh, the same or have similar capabilities? That's where passing interoperability guidelines come in place. And uh, as a vendor, you are not allowed to call yourself, uh, uh, your, your deployment of OpenStack or your product OpenStack unless you pass these guidelines. 
So why are we uh, even talking about interoperability? As I mentioned, uh, different OpenStack deployments ca can have different, uh, uh, can look different. Uh, I think even um, if you just look at the policy, I think Nova has like 400 policy options, so 400 plus. Uh, so as you can imagine, you can really fine tune everything in that deployment, like who can access what, and uh, uh, my OpenStack cloud might be very restrictive while uh, Mark has a private cloud that will let you as a user do everything and my pu public cloud will say, uh, uh you cannot, the only thing you can do is create a VM and delete a VM. Well, that's probably not great if you're uh, wanting to do something more creative and interesting with your OpenStack. Also, OpenStack is, uh, has several releases over, um, like I think a year we have two releases, so uh, if you've been running OpenStack since 2012, you might be still on Essex or uh, whatever, uh, or Folsom, and uh, you know, is that something that your user will want to buy? And uh, if my cloud is on Folsom and I'm selling it to you as OpenStack, and you, you're not, you know, you're not asking me the right questions, you, you know, you might find yourself in an adequate version of OpenStack. So. Uh, our current interoperability guidelines cover um, uh, three and a half releases or so, or the last three and an upcoming one. Um, another thing that I mentioned was that you must be running OpenStack code. So when you, uh, you have, if you're running, uh, if you're passing the guidelines and you can say, hey, I am, I passed all of these tests that are testing API. API is all that matters. But if you're running um, uh, Ceph, for example, uh, with your OpenStack deployment, is that really full OpenStack? Is that pure OpenStack? Yes? What do you think? So, I know that <laughs> Right? So, uh, you are very, very close. So, yes, uh, if you are running uh, Nova, Keystone, Neutron, and Ceph, you can still call yourself OpenStack, but you cannot call your cloud uh, OpenStack powered. You, uh, you, you just can use the OpenStack compute part. Uh, and, yes, there is. Uh, why does Swift does not have different backends? We're not we're not going to answer that question here. <laughs> That's a, a different. Uh, you have to talk to the Swift guys. But uh, as part of the, since we are guarding the OpenStack logo, as uh, as part of that, we have to make sure that whoever wants to say that they have uh, OpenStack storage, which is uh, Swift backend, that they actually running Swift and not just passing Swift API tests. Um, it, because you could potentially be passing all of the um, guideline tests and running Ceph behind it. Um, now, that meets your requirements. It probably meets your user requirements, but you cannot get the full logo, uh, which, which is fine. You still get the compute part. So why do users and operators care? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, users want to know what they're getting. Um, as part of the user survey, uh, what we heard was that uh, users don't like being locked in uh, into vendors, and that, that's one of the reasons they pick OpenStack. Uh, interoperability also fosters strong ecosystem of tools, and uh, uh, it's also as part of the user survey, we heard that um, People like the OpenStack enables them to accelerate ability to innovate. Um, and common uh, behavior of OpenStack enables uh, usage of tools such as Ansible, Terraform, Puppet, etc. And 
As I'm sure you have been hearing here at the summit, a multi-cloud is real. People are using multiple different clouds, whether it's uh, multiple different OpenStack deployments or uh, OpenStack, AWS, Google Cloud. People want to use all of that. Um, we want to make sure that open, at least the OpenStack part is consistent. So how are we getting there? How do we guarantee that my OpenStack behaves similar to Mark's OpenStack? Uh, so we have current programs that I kept mentioning. And right now we have uh, three different programs that you could get logos for, or OpenStack logos. Uh, the top level one is uh, OpenStack powered, uh, and uh, that covers both compute and storage. And if you are running uh, just Nova with something else, or you're not running Swift, you can just call yourself uh, OpenStack compu uh, Powered Compute. Uh, if you are running just Swift uh, with, uh, with Keystone, you can, get, you can also get OpenStack logo, but you'll be calling yourself storage. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're running Nova with Ceph, you will qualify for the compute, but not for the platform one. Any questions about these programs? So right now we have 34 uh, distributions and appliances, uh, 12 public clouds, and since 16 uh, managed offerings in OpenStack Marketplace all have passed uh, um, these, uh, our current guidelines, whether it's uh, for OpenStack uh, compute or the whole thing, and uh, you, you're able to f pick and choose what you want if you are a customer and want to buy public cloud. Uh, all of those, uh, if you find these uh, products on the marketplace, you can be guaranteed that they have passed the guideline, and on the website it will show which guideline they have passed. And I think I already mentioned some of these things earlier. OpenStack Powered Compute, it will require uh, Nova, Cinder, Glance, Neutron, and Keystone projects. It, uh, in the current guideline, there are 214 tests, and uh, uh, it's really not a lot of tests to pass. I think the total Tempest uh, test code base is huge. So we really just narrowed down to the essentials in terms of functionality, what it is that you must have. Uh, OpenStack Power Storage requires only 49 tests. Um, so it's, if you cannot pass that, then you really can call yourself uh, OpenStack Powered Storage. Um, I think, uh, and that's just a, doesn't have most of, uh, a lot of the more complex with functionality. So if you're just a user, you can easily, uh, pass those tests. And uh, OpenStack Power Platform, as I mentioned already, it requires both compute and storage. So if you're uh, trying to certify your cloud, how do you get there? Or how do you pass these guidelines? What can you do? Um, so we have this wonderful tool, RevStack, and uh, Catherine, uh, is the PTL of the project. It is a tool set for testing interoperability uh, between OpenStack clouds. It is a database web, uh, backed website and it supports collecting your test results and it pu publishes them on the RevStack website. The, um, the results can be anonymous or you can, if you want, I think you can enter uh, your information and, and share it. I think most of the results right now are anonymous there but uh, as a user, you can create profile there and register your company's test results. And uh, it is a community developed project. If you're looking for open source project to get involved in, this is a great one. And this is, this is what the test run results look like. Uh, as you see, there is a guideline version that you get to select and uh, target program and how many tests have passed and uh, this is just a screenshot, so it doesn't show everything, but you, if there are any failures, it will show how many tests failed, and you can click in and see what exactly failed. So who uses RevStack? 
vendors, if you are trying to certify your OpenStack um, against a particular guideline, RevStack is the way to do it. Uh, if you are a user or a cloud administrator, uh, you can go and see uh, which vendors have pa uh, smeared the results and uh, you can also compare how, what your, how your test results compare to other tests. Um, refs, if you are running RevStack, please submit all of the results, all of the Tempest tests, not just for the ones that are required. So how guidelines <coughs> get made, and here's, the, here's where I hand over to Mark. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what goes into making guidelines. Um, so we do have a six-month cadence, which follows the OpenStack releases. Um, it is offset by a couple months from the OpenStack releases themselves. So that's why you get this concept of every guideline covers three and a half releases, right? Because we have uh, uh, a release train that will be in development uh, while we're writing that guideline. Uh, so we go ahead and forward, uh, uh, forward it so that uh, when it does come out, um, in between the two guidelines, uh, the current, most current guideline will cover the most current release. Um, vendors can use either of the two newest guidelines uh, when they apply to the OpenStack Foundation for uh, logo and trademark license. Um, and all these guidelines are created by us and ultimately boarded on by the, uh, voted on by the board of directors. Um, so all that work has to be uh, approved by the board. Um, it's a little different than a lot of other OpenStack projects where ultimately the governor is the TC for us, it's actually the board of directors. Um, and ultimately, they have to um, approve whatever we do. Um, so uh, they, don't, uh, they don't vote plus twos in Garrett, like other projects. It's uh, every six months, we roll out something to them at a board meeting, and uh, there's an actual roll call vote uh, that happens at the board meetings. <clears throat> um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the next couple of bullets uh, in the next, next couple of slides here. Um, basically, for all the capabilities that we want to include in these uh, interoperability guidelines, um, we basically go through, look at the APIs or, or whatever other capabilities we want, um, and then the group uh, scores those based on 12 criteria that we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and uh, one, one sort of key thing is that um, because we are covering multiple OpenStack releases, whatever features we vote into these guidelines have to be present in all of those releases. Um, and so keep in mind there also vendors can use either the two most recent guidelines. So there's actually a pretty good spread of releases. Um, that should tell you that what we're looking for is pretty core, stable stuff that people use. Not like the new shiny objects, right? It's got to be around and baked and people are actually using it before we actually require everybody to, uh, uh, to have it in their products. Um, candidate capabilities. Um, they also have to have tests. Um, so obviously we can't uh, verify that clouds actually provide this stuff if we don't have a test for it. Um, today, um, the TC has asked that um, for scoring criteria that we only consider tests that are in Tempest. Um, that's kind of a, an ongoing discussion that we have with the community. Uh, we'll see where that goes in the future. Click, maybe not, <laughs> try again. All right, so let's talk about scoring criteria. Um, so I mentioned that there are 12 criteria and you can kind of see those in sort of the pink boxy looking things around the edges there. Um, these are the criteria that we have. Uh, in the middle of the, of the kind of circle there, um, you'll see basically you know, what we're trying to get at with those criteria. Um, so if something uh, is gonna show proven usage in the field, then we think it should be widely deployed, it should be used by tools, and it should be used by clients. Um, if a shiny new feature comes out and it's not present in OpenStack client and has no support in Horizon, chances are not many people are using it. Um, similarly, if uh, a feature is not used by a lot of the tools in the, uh, supported by a lot of tools outside of the OpenStack ecosystem, um, like say Terraform or Ansible or, or um, maybe even uh, platforms with cloud providers like Kubernetes, uh, then chances are, again, maybe that's not such a widely used feature, right? Um, for some of these criteria, we, we try to be um, proactive about looking both at uh, sort of documented uh, things that we have, like the user survey, to see who's using what. Uh, and we also actually go uh, look out at um, the, the larger ecosystem for some of the stuff. Like, I've, I've actually spent quite a bit of time fishing around in jclouds code um, to see if, you know, certain OpenStack APIs actually appear to be supported by jclouds. Uh, same with Fog, same with um, uh, Ansible and, and several others. Um, so the, the scoring exercise here can be a little bit laborious, and that's why we only do one of these every six months. <laughs> because it actually takes a good amount of time to, to look at this stuff. Um, I guess all I need to say about that. So how stuff actually gets added, um, 
ultimately, when we're scoring these things, it's a bit of a subjective process, right? Ultimately, this comes down to human beings going around looking and saying, I think that this actually meets these criteria or not. Um, funny thing is that in the OpenStack community, we have a lot of subjective processes, like um, whether code is good or not is kind of subjective as well. <laughs> um, and so we have reviews, um, and we have core reviewers that vote these things ultimately in or out. Um, and we have a feedback system with, with code reviews. Um, we use that same process uh, for determining these guidelines. Basically, all the scoring goes through Garrett. Um, so somebody submits a patch to Garrett and says, I think this meets these criteria and it's good enough to get into a guideline. Um, the rest of the interoperability group members can chime in. Anybody in the community can chime in. If you've got a Garrett account, you can go vote on our reviews. Um, and then ultimately, the core viewers um, plus two or, or, or not. Um, and at the end of the day, whatever we, roll, we put in there uh, rolls up to the board of directors and they, they ultimately vote yes or no. Um, again, we, we look at um, kind of a lot of different data sources. Um, kind of one of the, the early criteria that we use is does the thing being proposed actually have tests that we can use? Uh, because if not, there's no real point in, in doing all the rest of the work. <laughs> um, so the first thing we do is go look at Tempest tests. Um, one of the criteria that we have for this is that um, users of clouds should actually be able to verify these things themselves. Um, so if I want to go use Rackspace Public Cloud, I should be able to verify that, hey, they, they said they adhere to this guideline and it actually does all that work. Um, so the tests that we look for in Tempest are ones that don't require administrative access, don't require multiple user accounts, um, and are therefore much easier for uh, mere mortals in clouds to go verify for themselves. Um, so you know, there's, there's kind of 12 criteria here. They have different weights. Um, they're, there are a few that are sort of less important than others um, in, the, in the grand scheme when we kind of figure out the, the totals. Um, when people kind of ask me like, so I have this thing, I'd like to see everybody support it. What's, what's the key thing I need to do to get it into a guideline in the future? The answer generally is wide adoption. So a lot of the other criteria kind of surround uh, how widely adopted something actually is. Um, and that's uh, adoption both from a product perspective and from a user perspective and an ecosystem perspective. So there, there's kind of multiple, multiple things there. Um, if, it's, if it's a thing that's not supported by a lot of different clouds, well, chances are it's gonna fall flat on a lot of criteria. Um, same thing for um, you know, some of the other things we looked at here. Um, if, it's, if it's not stable, if it's something that's changing quite a lot from release to release because it's a shiny new object, again, chances are you know, if, if you uh, can't, can't show wide adoption of that in the tooling ecosystem. You know, people can't use Ansible with it, can't, can't configure it with Puppet, can't you know, do whatever they need to do with um, Terraform or, or, or uh, run Kubernetes on top of a cloud that has this. Again, chances are a lot of these other criteria are gonna fall through as well. So that's really kind of the, the key metric that we focus in on uh, kind of early in the process is sort of a, sort of a um, not a final answer, but kind of a, an indicator of whether something's gonna be a good candidate or not. All right, so let's talk about future programs. Um, everything we've talked about so far has been kind of what's out there today. Um, and you know, we, we kind of gave you the numbers on, on tests. It's not a huge battery of tests, and a lot of it is very basic functionality. So it's stuff like, can I get my VMs up? Can I create my networks? Um, uh, pretty, pretty simple stuff for the most part. Um, what we've actually found is that there are a couple of emerging needs. Um, we talked earlier about how OpenStack is kind of a very rich, very flexible platform, and we built something that actually fits a whole lot of different use cases, it turns out. And some of those use cases are very different from one another. So kind of a general purpose compute cloud actually looks pretty different from one that's designed to say run NFV, right? Um, NFV clouds have uh, requirements around things like maybe I need a NUMA or a scheduler, maybe I need PCI pass-through, maybe I need cer certain things in orchestration, uh, maybe I need certain performance out of a data plane. Uh, so those characteristics can look a lot different. Um, the other thing we found is that there are a lot of people uh, using some of the projects that aren't as widely adopted, and they may be sort of small in number compared to the whole general population of OpenStack users, but they actually really care a whole lot about compatibility for those projects that they are using. Um, so there again, it's something where if they're using vendor A, vendor B should also support the same thing in their minds, right? So we'll talk about that, that kind of use case first. Um, something they're working on developing now is what we're calling add-on programs. Um, and sort of the example we, we'll use for this is designate. Um, so DNS is a service. Um, if you look at the most recent user survey, um, prod and non-prod clouds combined, only about 16% of the people that responded to the survey are actually running designate. So it's a pretty small number. And if you look back at our criteria, it's certainly probably not gonna hit widely adopted, 
Um, and a lot of the other criteria may fall away as well as a result of that. So it's kind of a tough one to say, yes, that is a core piece of OpenStack that only 16% of the population is using. Um, at the same time, though, we hear feedback, um, you know, in, in sort of my day job, I hear feedback all the time from people that want Designate um, because they have a real need for uh, hooking up DNS to their clouds. Um, what we'd like to do is get to a point where for projects that uh, sort of have, have an established user base out there that cares about this stuff, um, we'd like for them to have a way to define what does inter interoperability look like for that project. Um, so if I just look at the 16% of the population that's actually using Designate, what is, what is sort of core for them? What are the things that they expect to work from cloud implementation to cloud implementation to cloud implementation? Um, and then we want to have some way to reflect that um, kind of in the OpenStack marketplace, right? Um, so if I go look at the OpenStack marketplace today, I can see, you know, 16 uh, public clouds, and I want to know which ones actually support those Designate APIs, right? Uh, so this is kind of where the concept of add-on add -on programs come in. Um, so we have OpenStack powered platform and compute and storage today. What we're thinking about doing is also having sort of an additional badge. It probably will have something nicer than a small yellow block <laughs> in, the, in the logo. Um, but basically some way for providers to say, this product also supports the DNS. Uh, and that means it has passed this extra set of tests for projects that run Designate. Um, we're kind of, kind of piloting this out now with just a couple of projects uh, since it's early days before we kind of, kind of open it up. Um, so goals, um, again, users that depend on those less, less widely used projects um, want those interoperability gu guarantees as well. So hopefully this is a way to deliver that for them. Um, and moreover, we'd kind of like to um, make the whole process of determining what interoperability means less centralized for us. Um, so it turns out we have a fairly small number of people on the interop work group, and there's a vast number of projects in OpenStack that people use. Right? So wouldn't it be great if those projects who really actually know the technical details and probably hear a lot from users, um, if they had a, a more direct say in kind of defining what interoperability looks like for them. Right? And you can kind of see that some, some projects have already done a bit of work in that direction, like uh, Cinder actually has uh, capabilities that are, they sort of require for all entry drivers. Right? So those are things that are core for them um, as, as kind of an example. Um, Generally, we want people to use like the same general criteria as the powered programs, but just sort of looking at the, the audience that it actually applies to. So again, um, designated example, if there's 16% of users out there, well, let's look at those 16% and see what's common across those, right? Um, it kind of also goes without saying we uh, are angling to use kind of the same tool sets that we use for this. Um, so the same languages and the same schemas that we use to define the interoperability guidelines today will apply to these programs as well. All right, so the other use case I mentioned is, is what we're calling vertical programs. Um, so now that we have this big flexible platform that's good for a lot of different use cases, we're kind of now at that point in OpenStack's lifecycle where we're seeing it move into kind of niche use cases um, that have pretty, pretty big different requirements. Um, in this case, we'll use NFE as an example. Um, NFE is like something you hear about all the time at OpenStack Summit now. I'm sure nobody has walked down the hall and not heard people talking about NFE. Um, and again, this is something that probably has very different requirements uh, from some from general purpose compute clouds. <coughs> um, here again, for people that are actually actually care about running NFV uh, on top of their uh, open side clouds, um, there are certainly some things that they would like to see in terms of being able to run them on different clouds and expect the same results, right? Um, so these people care about interoperability as well. Um, so what we're doing here, um, kind of similar goals, right? The use cases for which OpenStack is very popular should have those same interoperability standards um, so that we have the, the reduced vendor lock-in and all the other things that we talked about in the user survey that people care about. Um, we also want to help foster those vertical ecosystems, just like we do the general ecosystem, right? One of the things that um, the foundation was hoping to get out of this whole interoperability push was make OpenStack more accessible to people, um, help foster a rich ecosystem of tools around it that can use it, um, make it more accessible to things that want to ride on top of OpenStack, like uh, say Kubernetes or OPNFE or you know, whatever else. Um, we want to do that for these sort of vertical use cases as well. Um, and we want to work with the adjacent communities um, to work out what capabilities are actually needed. Uh, so here again, um, people that know a lot about general purpose compute clouds don't necessarily know what goes into making a good NFV platform, right? Uh, turns out we have a lot of friends in the open source community that do. 
So, uh, and you see some of them here at the, uh, the open source uh, community days that we have here at the summit. OPNFD is here, FDIO is here, I think, um, and a few others. <clears throat> this is kind of one of those, those cases where um, reaching out to some of those adjacent communities would make a lot of sense. Um, and again, same general criteria is powered but applied to these specific use cases. So rather than uh, a chunk of the population, we're looking at a, a, a portion of the population that has a specific use case here. All right, so where do we start? Um, this, is, this is kind of two big new programs in addition to the work that we're already doing for, for the general sort of core open SAC stuff. Um, so we're, we're, as we kind of develop these programs, we're kind of starting small and working our way up. Uh, for the add-on programs, we're working mostly with Trove and Designate right now. Um, and for the vertical programs, we're looking at NFB as kind of the first use case there. Um, that is not a final list by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, walk first, then run, right? <coughs> Um, so we've just finished a lot of the scoring work on the next um, OpenStack uh, interoperability guidelines. Um, so pretty soon here, we should be able to now, now kind of get underway with, with some of this work for add-ons and verticals. One of the things that we're working on right now is that the schema we use to define interoperability guidelines is not well suited for kind of some of the things that we want to do in these new programs. Um, so we're working on a new version of the schema uh, that kind of gives us the flexibility to add some of the things that we need for these programs. Uh, and that's under review right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we'll put these slides online later so you can go click on all the, all the links here. But um, if you're interested in, in this work, either uh, the existing guidelines uh, or, or some of the new programs we talked about, uh, there's some information here about how you can get involved or find more information. Uh, of course, you can always find us here as well. And with that, we will go to questions. Would you mind using the mic so that pe in, people can hear the recording? Uh, point, I think so far the dev core or interoperability, the brand just, uh, just faced some challenges, okay? Especially because there's uh, very few <coughs> customers who realized the brand is okay or is important or not. He don't have any, any idea about what is uh, the Def core, what is the mm -hmm. interoperability? Okay, that's the first uh, challenge. Because, uh, for example, like uh, in China, okay, maybe the, the China Telecom use the uh, OpenStack, okay, they passed uh, the Def core, but the Golden Cloud is not, doesn't to use uh, the uh, Def core, but they use a part of uh, the, 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 def, uh, the OpenStack the project, mm -hmm. but they didn't uh, pass that. But from customer side, he don't know what is the difference. Okay, so my first uh, suggestion is uh, how we can to promote. Yep. That is very important because if no promote, no customer, no interesting, the the the, the, the brand, nobody knows what's that. Okay, yeah. right. And so that's just uh, our people to do that. But uh, for outside, nobody know what is going on. Okay, that's the first. Second. You said it's OFV, but so far OFV also have a test program mm -hmm. to do the same thing. How we can alignment the different and uh, for others, not only for the uh, OFV. For example, yep. in industry, <coughs> in the manufacturing industry, they have another organization we call is IIC. Yep. Okay. How we can align with IIC test program? They also have a test bed. They also have a test program. They also have to test uh, the brand, how we can align it. Because, and the third question, because uh, so far, the OpenStack is uh, not only cross product, the di distribution product, few to few, but the cloud, it means it's, uh, it needs to align the application. It's not only for the, for the computer storage, mm -hmm. right? So that's the uh, only care about is the uh, service, the experience, that's the more care about that. For example, like in China, they have a want to do is a trust cloud the program. Trust the cloud program means it's a, they just like a hotel, one star, five stars. Okay, mm -hmm. they can to separate. Okay, maybe you cloud only just five one star. Mm -hmm. Okay, you cloud can be five star. Okay, 
That, that is very important because the, the customer can have a right to choose the different start. Okay, if you want to cheap, you can choose one start. If you want uh, delicious, you can choose a five start. So my means is uh, how we can to cooperate with that, this program. Yeah. Okay? Because uh, for example, like trust uh, cloud program, they don't think the dev core is important. Okay, they don't care about that, right? Well, so, <laughs> So uh, you have this some is my personal, yeah, so, okay. so personal thinking. Let, let's take those one at a time because that was, that was a lot of questions all at once. Yeah. <laughs> um, so starting at the top, uh, let's talk about recognition, right? Uh, promotion in the industry of what this actually is and what it means. So that is actually why a few months ago they changed the name from Def Core to Interop because there were a lot of questions from analysts about what does Def Core mean? Because I hear this name and I don't know what it means. When we say Interop, uh, Interop Working Group, all of a sudden the analysts get it. They know what happens, right? So the foundation has heard that message already and is starting to work in that direction. Part two of that is um, you just saw them rebrand the entire marketplace. Just got pushed live, I think, last week. Um, so they're actually moving toward, um, you know, how do we talk about promoting the products in the ecosystem as well, right? right. Um, and a big part of that is making it more clear uh, in the future, like, what products actually pass which standards. Um, and that is now kind of front page news. If you just scroll down the list of, of providers that are in there, um, the, one of the very first things you'll see is that tested logo and a, um, uh, the number of the guideline that they, they passed. And also, um, <coughs> if you see a cloud that calls itself OpenStack and they have not passed uh, this interoperability guideline, they cannot call themselves OpenStack. Yeah. So, so you know, if you're talking to uh, someone that you just met and they say, I have this great OpenStack cloud, and you, the next question you should have is, great, which guideline have you passed? Because otherwise they, they, can, uh, they, can call, they can use OpenStack code base, no problem, but to call themselves OpenStack, they have to pass the guidelines. Yeah. Yes, but uh, frankly say, I think just a few people know interoperability also is uh, difficult to understand. I mean, Dev is and the difficult answer, but interpretability. My suggestion is that we need to find the local, the coordinate, to help us to promote that. Because I frankly say many Chinese, the customer don't know the English. Right. They don't know what is the difference, right? Great yeah. point. Yeah. So will you help yeah. us in China? And also in Europe, in Germany, also is somebody also have, have an idea what is the difference. So it's my personal opinion, because I just communicated with some main customers, right? They just said, you're power rate of the open stake. Okay, what's that? Yes. <laughs> just like, no, you know? So my means is that name is not so important, but also, of course, that's important. But we also need the local, the coordinate, especially the customer. They have a lot of customer, so they can promote us. That is important. Uh, yeah. I think that's a great point, and maybe we can uh, uh, have you work with the foundation to publish an article in Chinese that explains what that is. Yeah. So uh, that probably would be very helpful. Yeah. So I, I was about to say that at the very last page, Dina, there is this slide that says, "Please support us or help us." <laughs> yes. Exactly Yes, we need you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's go to question number two, which now that we've talked about that, you're gonna have to remind me what question number two was. <laughs> uh, uh, <coughs> uh, number two is NFV and the vertical industry. Yes, Because okay. OpenV also have a protest program mm -hmm. that, that do the same thing, yeah. Right. Just, uh, just, you know, just uh, in this session, they're, they're talking about the NFV mm -hmm. test. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, so part of that is why we started working with folks like OPNFV, um, you know, our Poor friends right here in, in, in Fervo. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's kind of a big part. As we move into these vertical use cases, what we actually find is in many cases, there are um, at least some kind of, of programs out there that are maybe not necessarily interoperability, but in core functionality at least. Um, but again, kind of one of those things that doesn't address all the use cases, but what's, what's kind of a, a core comment that people should be able to expect, right? Um, our preference would be to work with them to help define the standards that we run, 
Um, and the foundation, the OpenStack Foundation would actually like to own the logos that say this is a, a product that you can run NFE on, right? Um, for our definition of whatever that is, right? Um, we don't want to create that in a vacuum, and that's why we started working with some of these other uh, outside organizations. Um, some of the testing for NFE specifically, um, some of the stuff that's out there now kind of um, is a layer two above the, the infrastructure layer, um, and sort of not as germane to, to, to what, what you need out of OpenStack in order to achieve that. Um, so there's, there's kind of a little bit of stuff to weed through as we, as we go through there. Um, for, for NFV especially, there's, there, there is quite a lot of testing out there uh, already being done. Uh, every year there's, um, I forget which, which group it is that sets up the uh, interoperability testing uh, that Light Reading publishes every year, for example. Uh, but some of that kind of rides way above the OpenStack layer. Um, it's great, but half of it is not germane to you know, what we're trying to do with OpenStack and what an OpenStack product needs to provide. Um, so that's, that's kind of the medium that we're trying to strike there, right? Um, okay, so question three was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the trust, the, <coughs> the service experience, and yeah. the, you know, yeah, basic. Right, so um, the, we actually talked a little bit about something kind of similar earlier on uh, in, the, in the development of the, the interoperability programs. Um, one of the things we found is that it's very tough to measure operational metrics, um, especially for the kind of um, breadth of products that we have here, right? So if I'm, a, if, if I'm a, it's like public cloud, it's relatively easy for somebody to externally monitor and say, yeah, that API is always up or down or, or whatever it is, right? Uh, or provides these things. Um, for say private cloud deployments, um, you know, half the installers out there, I can pick and choose which components I, I uh, deploy. Um, maybe I'm never gonna deploy Solometer, maybe I'm never gonna deploy, I don't know, Cinder, because um, I have no need for that. Um, and I'm gonna deploy it on a lot of different hardware in a lot of different network topologies, in a lot of different storage systems. So it becomes very difficult to, to kind of measure um, quality, if you will. Um, and that's something that the foundation has kind of shied away from because of that. Um, now, part of the programs that we, part of what we're doing with the add-on programs is trying to be a little bit more informative about what a commercial product actually provides, right? Um, so if you go to the, the website, there's, there's usually links in every vendor's um, uh, marketplace entry to where you can find more information about what it actually provides. We'd like to get that into a more centralized place. And then for the things that they do provide, actually say, is it actually interoperable with the other ones that are in the marketplace? So that's kind of the meme that we're striking here. It's not really so much about quality uh, or the amount of stuff that something provides. It's about the interoperability of the things that they do provide. Um, so if we've got one provider out there who's actually uh, providing, I don't know, Mistral or something, um, that's great. Not sure it's really a good target for interoperability since they're the only one providing it, right? Um, in, a, in a sort of quality or quantity system, um, they might sort of get an extra star for providing that project. Um, from an interoperability point of view, it doesn't really help. Right, but uh, at the <coughs> very minimum, any product that people sell and they call themselves OpenStack, make sure they're in the marketplace and that they have the link to the guidelines that they pass, and hopefully, they pass the latest guideline as opposed to uh, five guidelines back, which they wouldn't even qualify for the logo. Well, like, it depends, but you just show, we'll show you how old their product is and uh, how recently they have passed the guideline. So you can filter hopefully on that. Like if you want private cloud, uh, you know, search for one that has passed 2017-01 guideline or whatever the latest will be the, you know, in the future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So is it like a hundred percent criteria to get the stamp? Yes. So yes. Yeah. So basically, there, there's a list of you know 250 or whatever tests. Objective, right? right. If you fail to pass one of those, no logo. Okay. Yes, and uh, as you saw, the number of tests is not very big, and uh, if you pass only those tests, you like you probably wouldn't have a working open stack. Like yeah. you still have you still need a lot of other stuff. Uh, think of the guidelines as a minimum spec that you have to have. So you must implement uh, uh, creating VMs, you must provide a network, you must uh, ha have Cinder. Yeah, but uh, if you imagine I'm a vendor and everyone just implements, I don't know, security for example, because I have my own private uh, version of whatever. Um, I guess security is 
Yes. Well, you are many things, but you are not OpenStack. <laughs> yes. So if, if I, as a as a end user, cannot call the OpenStack API to get a security group, that's not really OpenStack, right? So if I have to call some third-party vendor API, that's great. It may give me all the same functionality, maybe even more functionality, right? Um, but it's not OpenStack. And that means that when I go try to use uh, the Ansible provider for OpenStack or the Terraform provider for OpenStack or try to run Kubernetes on top of it or any of these other things, it's going to break. Um, so it may be many things, but it's not actually interoperable. All right. And if you find yourself that you believe you, sh you are running <clears throat> OpenStack with all of the major functionality and it's failing one test, and if you can persuade us and the community that that test is either it's a bad test or it's not actually should not be required, then we can flag it. But in, and we have a process for that, so you, you can walk through it. And it's it's not it's not just purely you know uh, black and white. If you can persuade us that we made a mistake, and we do make mistakes uh, in evaluating things, you know we we can definitely uh, work with you. So it's it's not like that you don't have any options. Of course, you can all you know if if we say. If you come and say, you know what, I don't believe that uh, a user should be able to create VMs. I will create VMs for them. We're like, ah, well, maybe you should actually go and make sure that your cloud is able to spin up VMs, or a user is able to do that. You know, and obviously this is a very bad example, but uh, short of picking, you know, finer points of the guideline. But okay, um, I think we are pretty close to out of time. Uh, yeah, I think we have yeah. one minute. So if you have any questions, let us. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Let, let's talk about that. Um, so ultimately, what we send up from, from vendor, uh, vendors do the tests themselves, right, uh, and send up results to us. Um, it's essentially a text file. Um, you could game that system. Um, the enforcement angle comes from two directions. One is community policing. Um, we do hear occasionally from people that say, hey, uh, vendor said this was supported and it doesn't actually work. Um, part two is, is probably the stronger one. Um, when you get that logo from the foundation, you sign a legal document that I had to get, you know, when I did this for my company, I had to get like a senior vice president to go sign up a legal document. And boy, did they run that through a fine tooth comb. Um, so there are actually legal consequences for not adhering to that contract. Um, so it's kind of enforced through, through legal systems. Um, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I won't say how well they work across the world, um, but so far, so good. All right. And you know, and you as a user, if you go and uh, use, you say, you know, you start using something called Mushroom Cloud that uh, claims to be OpenStack based, and it does, you know, it's running uh, a no one <laughs> network in the back end. Uh, you, you know, you can, you know, ra raise a hand, send an email, and say, hey, this Mushroom Cloud claims that they're running OpenStack when, in fact, there's no way that they would be passing this guideline. Can you investigate? And uh, you know, so sometimes uh, people do make mistakes. Uh, they don't realize that they have to pass the guidelines to call themselves OpenStack, and then foundation will reach out to them and uh, ask them, "Hey, I, I, do you have plans to certify? If not, you know, consider removing the logo." So, and you know, I'm sure they have a nice conversation first, and then send them the lawyers. <laughs> All right. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll have to take that one to the hall because I think we're out of time, but um, we, we've had some conversations around that. Um, there, there are some challenges there. Thank you, right. everyone, for Thanks, coming. Everybody. You know how to get hold of us. <laughs>